Hey, everybody, it's Alex from Remote Work Life. I hope you're doing well. Wherever you may be in the world, I uh, have another esteemed guest with me today. I have Ben Saylor, who is Director of Inbound Marketing uh, with WordPress.com. I'm, I'm not going to talk through WordPress.com. If you don't know about WordPress.com, please go and have a look. I'm sure you, you know at least a little bit about WordPress.com. Ben, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolute pleasure. And uh, Ben, I, I, well, Ben, uh, I knew I wanted Ben on the on the show because, again, uh, Ben, I obviously do a lot of research into each guest. Ben has a really uh, interesting background, not just where remote work is concerned, but in general. And what I'll do, I'll leave his details in the show notes. You can see how his career has, has uh, gone on the incline. But apart from his career, I, I wanted to know Ben's backstory in terms of, you know, why why remote work, uh, you know, how his career has evolved. So, Ben, I mean, let's just start by finding out a bit more about you. Tell us a bit about you and uh, how you came to be at WordPress.com. Yeah, yeah. So I can start all the way at the beginning. Um, I went to college for journalism and PR. Um, and when I was nearing uh, graduation, I needed to build an online portfolio for myself. And that was how I stumbled upon WordPress.com. And that would have been about 12 or 13 years ago now, right. um, since I uh, f was first introduced to the um to the WordPress world through WordPress.com. And so I kind of got my start with WordPress, um, just figuring out how to build a portfolio for myself. Um, and then um, post-graduation, um, uh, got into uh, content marketing and SEO um, through uh, e-commerce. Um, my first career job outside of uh after uh, graduating was um, an e-commerce company that sold pickup truck <laughs> accessories, um, wow. which actually uh, was a really good experience. Um, it was a great company. Um, and, you know, since then, um, you know, WordPress, you know, being a, a content marketer and an SEO, um, WordPress has um, kind of been a, had been a, an, an ever present, you know, um, you know, you know, part of, of my career, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as a end user. Um, and so before I came to, um, to, to automatic and working for wordpress.com, um, I spent six years, uh, at a B2B SaaS company called CoSchedule, um, which actually mm -hmm. started, um, its existence as a WordPress plugin and then grew into a, um, full-fledged uh, SaaS uh, product. Um, and so that kind of provided a pretty natural bridge, I think, um, to, uh, you know, working, you know, for WordPress.com, which has really been an incredible opportunity. Um, definitely, it's definitely a dream role, <laughs> you know, not one that I ever thought that I would... Um, it's, it's not an opportunity that I, I ever thought I would have, you know. Um, and so been here for about a year and a half now. And, uh, yeah, it's been great. Yeah, I WordPress, actually, because my background is I've done some SEO myself. And I have WordPress to thank, although the other side of WordPress, WordPress.org. But I have right. WordPress to thank um, for enabling me with my, my career to make a transition into, um, into SEO because – like you, I, I I put online some of the projects that I've been um, working on using uh, WordPress to uh, so that people could see what I was doing and having all those great plugins. And I, Co Schedule is one of the plugins that I that I used as well. Oh, very cool. Content distribution. So yeah, lots of actually lots of similarities there as well in terms of um, the career path. And you you mentioned that. Uh, WordPress being a, a, a dream role for you as well. Um, and it, another question I want to ask you in, in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the, the role, I suppose, the, the, the evolution of your career is um, 
because I mean, different people search for roles in different ways. Some people mm-hmm. will um, use job boards. Other people will use their networks. Other people will, uh, you, you know, uh, get promoted internally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. What What was your method? What was your main go to in terms of getting your role actually with, with WordPress and generally speaking as well? Yeah, so it might not be the most interesting story. I actually just found the um, the listing through, uh, I saw it posted somewhere online. It might have been LinkedIn or Indeed mm-hmm. or one of those uh, types of sites. And then I um, applied and um, got an offer for an interview and it just kind of went from there. But you know, I'll say over the course of my career, I have learned about opportunities and landed opportunities through a number of different means. And so I feel mm-hmm. like um, with each company that I've worked for and with each career move that I made, it you know, this is something I hadn't really thought about before. But like looking back, like that process was a little bit different <laughs> for each one. Mm-hmm. So um my very first job that I got um, in the content marketing world, uh, I I almost never applied for because okay. like the, the way the story went, like I was like pretty desperately job hunting and um, I was just browsing Craigslist at like one mm-hmm. in the morning for just like, just to, uh, just out of curiosity, just to to see, you know, like okay, like I'm gonna do one more search and just check out what's on here, and then I'm I'm, I'm gonna go to bed. And I found this uh this company, um, in, in my area that I had never heard about before that was advertising a um, web content job, and that was something that I had never heard about. I didn't know anything about SEO or content marketing, but when I looked at the description, I was like, oh, this actually sounds exactly like what I'm looking for, Mm -hmm. Um, even though it was describing a bunch of things I had never heard about (laughs) before. (laughs) Um, So then I, um, yeah, just like sent off an application, um, and I was actually living out of state. I was living with my parents um, and uh, like like elsewhere. And I was kind of looking to move back to like the, the area where I went to college. And so uh, they got back to me like not too long after I applied. And then I just bought a one-way ticket, you know, for the interview. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, you know, I don't really want to live at home anymore. So I guess if this doesn't pan out, I'll figure something else out. But, but it worked. Nothing, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was no plan B, <laughs> really. Um, so, and then it ended up working out. And then after I was there for a couple of years, I got a job uh, working at um, working at an agency. And the way I got my foot in the door there was um, their uh, like director of content ran like a meetup group locally for um, for like content marketers and. Um, marketing professionals and so I regularly went um, to, to like these uh, meetup events and that was how I got to know like their director of content and so when they had an opening um, I kind of already had like a warm relationship mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. with them um, and so that ended up being a, a, a pretty powerful um it, it, it was a good in to uh, a good way in, yeah, yeah, yeah to get it to get an interview there. And then after I was there for a little over a year and a half, um, at co schedule, uh, Garrett Moon, the CEO and one of the co founders, found me on LinkedIn and sent me a message and was like, Hey, like, we're uh, building some cool things and you know we're looking to hire for a skill set similar to yours and it's just curious if you'd uh, want to take a phone call and I wasn't really looking to move on wasn't really sure that I wanted to leave um, like, like an agency working with you know enterprise companies well a mix of small businesses and enterprise but it was it was it was stable right 
I didn't mm-hmm. know if I wanted to leave stability for the startup world or anything like that. But I kind of figured, like, if the CEO of a company reaches out to you directly, at the very least, mm-hmm. you can um, you, you can take a phone call. Like, you've got 30 of minutes course. for a phone call. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I took a call, and it took about five minutes for me to be sold on the idea of um, uh, applying for that role. And so... That was kind of how that whole process started, and then I was there for six years, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then um, worked my way up from a content writer to a director level role, and um, yeah, and then that, that was how I got to WordPress.com. So each step along the way, like it's been a little bit different, and I think that's interesting because um, I feel like I hear all kinds of advice, and I've heard all kinds of advice about how like how how do you get your foot in the door in marketing like how do you move up like what's the best way to apply for jobs and like some people will say like well excuse me like well don't even bother with like things like linkedin or indeed or like oh you have to like know somebody and you have to network and i i would say like in my experience i think there's a lot of different ways that you can get a foot in the door and there's a lot of different ways you can move up and there are a lot of different ways that you can approach like a a job search and um i I don't know like my career definitely hasn't followed a linear path and there was no prescribed playbook that you could follow you know necessarily Mm -hmm. to duplicate all those steps but um i think if there was maybe um you know, I think if there's a common thread between all of those experiences, though, I would say that I just really kept an open mind toward new opportunities, mm-hmm. um, put in the work, demonstrated what I could do. Um, and, you know, I think it, it ultimately kind of came down to a mix of just being very persistent, doing a lot of networking and not really leaving any stones unturned, you know, when it Mm -hmm. came to like just researching where I could find opportunities or ways that I could meaningfully, you know, connect with the right people who were already doing the types of things that I wanted to be doing. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I think I've taken kind of a, in all of the above strategy that way. Um, And so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, that worked for me, I guess. Yeah, it, it, it sounds good. I, I think uh, Casey Neistat. I don't, I don't know if you've heard of Casey Neistat. The, yeah, yeah, uh, yep. The big, the big YouTuber. He, he, um, he, he kind of installs a similar, you know, uh, way of building a career. I think he made a video where he was talking about, you know, it's almost like your, your, your the way he views your career is. Obviously, you're going to have an overall plan of where you want to get to. But like you said, it's not always going to be a linear path to get there. Mm-hmm. But what he says is that sometimes what you're doing is you're, it's almost like if you imagine yourself, you're in a jungle and you're swinging from vine to vine and a nice vine comes along, you, you get hold of that vine and then another one, it's not going to take you in a straight path, but it's going to take you almost like a circuitous route, but eventually you'll get there, uh, get the, get in the direction that you want. Um mm-hmm. And it, 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 and as well as that, that you're, you're talking about having an open mind as well in terms of taking a phone call from the CEO that you mentioned there. What was it about? Because you mentioned, you know, there was something about what he said or something about the particular company that you liked. Mm-hmm. What was it about the company that you liked which convinced you to, to sort of learn more about the job and eventually take it? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there was a mix of things. I think the um, the first concern i had was wh- like was whether or not they were growing you know like were they mm-hmm. on a positive trajectory it's you know like most startups don't make it you know it's just kind mm-hmm. of a fact of life um and i think when you enter the startup world you assume a different kind of risk you know than you do when you're um maybe at a company that's more established um maybe has more of a track record and uh, maybe a little bit more clear, um, you know, outlook for its future. And so that was the first thing that um, that that he addressed. And then from there, a lot of it was just about um, 
the nature of the work itself and you know some of the upsides to working in a startup environment and you know having the ability to you know take more ownership of things get your hands dirty and move faster and mm-hmm. just like test and iterate and things like that you know because there's also a fact of life that when you're at an agency you're you're kind of a you're a set of hired hands um and a, a client might pay you for your your expertise or your your skills but um you're always working on behalf of somebody else and it's always um it's a little bit slower you're not quite as close to you know um as many things as what you are in a startup and so um and i just kind of like thought that through and i was like yeah you know what that sounds like a really good opportunity to grow and so i would say that like again um in that situation and i think in all others throughout my career every time i've made a move it was in pursuit of an opportunity to grow um and so it was always a matter of running toward something rather than Mm -hmm running away from something that wasn't working. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, it, it was the, the, the biggest thing was that it was a really good growth opportunity and it was kind of a, a rare opportunity to, uh, you know, get in pretty close to on the ground floor, you know, with a, a, a new company that had a pretty bright future. And, um, you know, that was around you know, 2015. And so Mm -hmm. um, I think content marketing as what we know it today, which is ever changing, you know, was growing into a hotter market than it ever had been before. And it was already a pretty hot market, but it was, there was just so many different factors that kind of came together that, you know, after it, it didn't take me long to kind of mull it over and just feel like, you know, it would be silly not to at least apply Consider. and see where it goes. Yeah. 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 And in terms of the um, the rem- remote aspect, so obviously WordPress.com uh, remote. was was co-shadow remote. And was that was when did that become consideration for you or, or yeah? Yeah, that's a yeah, it's a good question. So, um, no, CoSchedule at the time was not a remote company. I think we had when I joined, we had one person who worked remote, and then um, we actually they ended up leaving, and then it became a policy actually for a while that there would be no remote hires. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, at the time, and keep in mind, this was like 2015, 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of the rationale for that was there was a strong belief that people needed to be co-located in, you know, one uh, office. Or in CoSchedule's case, we had two offices. Um, but everybody worked in one of the two physical spaces. And there was this this belief that you really needed that for, you know, collaboration and culture and everything else. And when you have like a mix of people being co-located or like on site and, you know, just a, one or a handful of people remote, like the people who are remote never felt like they were like fully a part of the culture. And so I, I think there was just kind of a suspicion that it, wouldn't really be feasible to retain you know remote Mm -hmm. workers before that kind of um burnout would start to set in um the other part of it too is co-schedule is based out of north dakota which um assuming that not everyone listening to this show i mean might not be super familiar with the geography of the united states um north dakota is a very low population state um it's primarily fairly rural um there's there's always been opportunities in the technology industry here and there's a lot more now is actually like a pretty impressive amount if you look at it just on like a per capita basis um 
but the state did not really and does not have like a reputation you know for being like a technology hub and when you tell people that you're from North Dakota like it's pretty common to be met with um a certain degree of skepticism like people be like okay. like I didn't even know you had like electricity like let alone oh, no. like computers so <laughs> Um, which is exaggerating a tiny bit, but I've, I've had versions of that conversation many, many, many times over, over the years where it just blows people's mind that you could run a successful startup from a place that, you know, wasn't New York or San Francisco or Chicago, London, wherever. Right. Um, and so there was, um, there, there was a very strong desire, and this is true of every company that I have worked for that was based in North Dakota. There's a very strong desire to kind of show the country and like the world that we can compete. You know, like we don't need to move, you know, to go find opportunities. We'll build opportunities where we're at and we'll prove you wrong, um, was very much the attitude. And so that was back then. Now, um, I, I, I believe that, like, I, I mean, I haven't been there for about a year and a half, and so I, I can't speak with too much authority on anything that's happening there now. But they have opened themselves up to more remote roles, um, obviously, over, you know, at the, the peak of the pandemic. Obviously, we were mm -hmm. all working from home. Um, they're already kind of split between two offices that are a few hours apart. And so, um, and I think just like the, the um, I think that the business world and particularly like the technology sector, I think have just changed in such a way post COVID that remote work has just become so much more the norm right. than it was even a few years ago. And they have, I mean, like I said, I don't want to speak on their behalf too much, but um, I mean, I, I think that they've definitely changed with the times in that regard. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, once everybody kind of starts hiring remote, you know, like what happens is that for a time, you know, there's kind of a... Um, there's something to be said for being like a big fish in a small pond. Right. And so for like a, a while, like they were pretty able to like very easily attract a lot of the top local talent. Um, but once all of your local talent now has the opportunity to go work for almost whoever they want, you know, or in not necessarily whoever you want <laughs> yeah, in the world, but you have like your, your opportunities have opened up immensely. Um, that becomes less of a competitive advantage. And so I think that probably factors into that decision too. Um, well, yeah. Um, so that that's kind of the story there. You know, something I think about was like, had things been different, like around 2011, 2012, you know, when I was kind of applying for like my first job in the industry, I mean, I bought a one-way ticket to fly to another state for an interview, you know, and that's just, I can't see anybody doing that now. I wouldn't do that. I doubt now. it, yeah. So. Not in this, yeah. It's it's quite, um, the situation at the moment, certain companies, certain sectors are quite volatile, isn't it? That, that yeah. you wouldn't, I've been hearing, I mean, I, I know there is, there is, there are people getting jobs, there are people, you know, companies hiring still, but I think people are a bit more cautious about how they uh, they navigate their, their their job search and their career. But for sure, yeah, that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing I've done actually um, in in my day. I mean, probably not now. Obviously, I've got kids and everything like that, so it wouldn't happen mm -hmm. now. But uh, yeah, I quite like the idea of buying a one way ticket. Um, <laughs> yeah, and in terms, so you where are you located now, Ben? Where where are you where are you calling from at the moment, or where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm still I, I'm in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, you're, you're in Fargo, okay. Yeah, and yep. What about your team? Where, where's your team? Because, uh, well, I'm assuming you've got team team across America, maybe potentially. Where, where's your team based, mainly? Who's on your team? 
Yeah, so it's a fairly small team. There's a few of us, and we are based... We're split up between, like, Fargo and then Athens, Georgia, um, Louisiana, Colorado. Um, and I've also worked with a number of freelancers that we've collaborated with who are um, located all over the world, like different parts of the U.S. Um, I've worked with freelancers from uh, the U.K., um, Nigeria. Um, so, yeah, all, all over the world. It's um, I, I think it automatic – you know, we've got employees in, I think it's either 90, 90 or 100 yeah. countries or something like that. And so, but like my team is, we're scattered across the U.S. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for you, I mean, you you cut, you were touching on your accessibility has been into to roles or at least the, the, the fact that you're in Dakota or certain people in North Dakota is limiting for them in a, in a certain degree, but mm. you've been able to benefit from that from, you know, now working for, for WordPress.com uh, automatic. How else has, how else has uh, working remotely helped you, benefited you? And at second to that, because um, I, I know that certain people who I've spoken to who previously worked co-located, but now working remotely, mm-hmm and don't necessarily want to go back to working on a co-located situation. What's your, what's your thoughts there? So that's two questions in one, really. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think for how it's benefited me, it's, I mean, it's created opportunities that I would not have had access to unless I was willing to move, which I don't really want to do (laughs) at this point in my life. So, um, so I think that's the biggest thing. It's, um, you know, if if taking a job with a company like Automatic, and then like it's different with Automatic because Automatic's always been all remote. Um, but if I wanted to take an opportunity with like a lot of companies that I might have considered to be like dream companies, you know, once upon a time, um, you know, as recently as a few years ago, that probably would have meant like you've got to move to San Francisco, you've got to move to New York, you've got to move to a large, expensive city where you don't know anybody. And there's just a lot of um, trade-offs there that would have been difficult to rationalize. Um, And so I think that's the biggest thing. It's, um, you know, when you're you know, when, when the job market isn't so closely tied to geography, you can make different kinds of decisions, you know, with, in terms of how you navigate your career and what, what opportunities you pursue. And so I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've benefited from. I think beyond that, just, there's a lot of things with like flexibility, you know, like when you work in a remote and, and asynchronous environment, um, if you just need to get things done, like you need to go get a haircut, say, or um, you remember you forgot something at the grocery store and you need to peace out for 15 minutes to go, (laughs) you know, like pick something up or um, you want to take a break and just like take the dog on a walk or something like that. Like those are all things that you can do and you've got a lot of flexibility in terms of how you structure your work day in a way that um, can make your work day just kind of better fit with everything else, you know, that you have going on in, in your life. And so I still keep pretty regular hours cause I like having a somewhat traditional structure, but um, you know, it's, I, I know there are some people that work better early in the morning and so they're up super early, like, getting their work day started and some people are night owls. And so like, I'll get pings from them at like 11 PM, you know, not that like they expect an immediate response. It's just, um, 
you've got your no- just... notifications on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or m- more what it is is like when I check my notifications in the morning, I'll see I've got a notification that somebody had to have sent at like 10 or 11 p.m. It's just because that's when they choose to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that having that kind of flexibility is really nice. Um, in terms of like whether or not I would ever want to go back to like a co-located, you know, type of work environment. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> like, I don't have <laughs> I any. I get that, actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't have. Um... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I never wake up in the morning. I'm just like, oh, I wish I could go to an office, you know. <laughs> Um, there are, I have, I have, I like, I do like go work from coffee shops and things like that. And, um, there's, uh, some good co-working spaces in my area too. Um, that's something else that's a, like a nice benefit is like, you can just change your scenery every day yeah, if you wanted to. Yeah. So, um, yeah. that's good too, just to kind of, uh, not spend like, my whole life in my house um so no, they yeah. think that we do that people think that because you work remotely <laughs> you spend the whole the whole life you know in fact you don't even get out of bed maybe you've got a laptop in your lap and you just uh yeah yeah right <laughs> and just like a coffee maker like right next to your, your like bedside yeah. and like yeah, I think that those, I, I kind of wish that those stereotypes and cliches would go away, but um, I don't know. Uh, I, I still, like, I'm up pretty early every day. I still make myself presentable. I definitely mm. do not hang out in my pajamas just doing whatever all day i guess i would actually go insane like i i couldn't live that way so um but i think that is there is like a good point there so i think that for anybody who is considering um you know for anyone who is considering like switching to the the remote work uh lifestyle full time um, you have to know yourself well enough to know whether you can be disciplined enough to mm-hmm. um, you know, just get your stuff done and be reliable and be accountable and not let yourself go, <laughs> you know, just because you mm-hmm. don't have like a physical space where people are going to see you that you have to go to every day. And that's a pretty fundamental thing, or, like a pretty basic thing that you always hear when people talk about like remote work, but it's really important not, not to overlook the importance of um uh, of that. You know, if if you kind of see it as an opportunity to um I, I don't know. If you see it as is an opportunity that you think you can abuse, you probably shouldn't go for it. Yeah. Definitely. And I like the, you're a bit like me in the sense that I like to change my scenery. And in fact, I was, I was at the office of one of my, my friends just the other day. Mm. And I was just waiting for him and I was looking around the office and it was, um, there was music, like really loud music. And I think to myself, I couldn't, as much as I like music in the background, I was thinking mm-hmm. to myself, I couldn't work here because the music would just interrupt me. And then the, the desks, it was just an open planned office. Yeah. Where you had sort of pods, but each pod was face to face and very, very close. You could each person could hear the other person speaking and they had the headsets on, but it was very loud. And then there were people it was just completely as as far as I could, could, could see, it was it wasn't an environment that would suit me. I mean it, it's mm-hmm. suits some people. And I love that like you said, that flexibility of being able to change your environment. If you want to put music on, you can put music on. If you don't want to put music on, if you want to go to a coffee shop, if you want to, you know, work from home, all of these different things, which makes remote work such a uh, benefit to so many people, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's me. And, but um, another question I wanted to ask you as well, because obviously you're managing a you're managing a remote team, but you're managing on a, on a asynchronous basis, and um, there's lots of people still trying to figure out how best to do that. I know there's different ways of doing it, but how, how do you make it work for you and your team? 
Yeah, so I think um, I'm fortunate in the sense that I think that because Automatic has always been a remote company, we have a lot of good um, tools and infrastructure in place to make it pretty easy. Or not mm -hmm. to say easy, but um, we have a lot of processes and things in place that are already existing that just work really well. Um, and so, you know, we have, um, I mean, we have Slack obviously, and then, you know, like Zoom and Google Meet and things like that, that make, you know, for times that you do need like face-to-face -face conversation, um, it's pretty easy. Uh, I think in terms of management, um, the one thing is like, you have to be, you have to be a little extra diligent about checking in on people, not necessarily in terms of like looking over their virtual shoulder to see what they're working on, but more just to like kind of like see how people are doing because you can't physically witness someone's struggle, you know, and it's not as easy for somebody Yeah. in an office. It's really easy to just get up and go talk to somebody and like obviously like in an async like remote environment it's pretty easy to like reach people on slack and things like that but there can be some things that just get lost just in terms of interpersonal communication when you're communicating mostly through text um and so you, yeah you have to um you, you just have to be really proactive i think with communication and always over communicate and um, and also be very clear in your communication mm -hmm. because things can come across much, much, much differently in writing than they might, you know, verbally out loud. And so of course. those are probably the biggest things um, that, that I've learned. I think that some of the biggest things that are different about, you know, leading people in a remote environment versus one where you're all in a shared space. Um, I mean, the last office I worked at, CoSchedule, that was a, an open floor plan, too, with the, the pods. And, you know, what, what's, what's pretty typical, you know, for, um, you know, I think especially for tech companies, it's a pretty typical way out. Yes. And, um, yeah, I mean, that type of setup has its pros and cons. But, you know, one of the pros, you know, like I said, is um, it's pretty easy to just go... Uh, go grab people and go talk to people, you know, mm -hmm. in a way that, and, and, and it is in a remote environment too. It's just different, you know, the way that um, you might approach some of those kinds of impromptu unstructured sort of conversations, you know, outside of, you know, scheduled meetings and things like that. So um, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. It's really important, you know, that your organization have like the right tools and the right processes, the right infrastructure, the right set of shared expectations in place. But if you're fortunate to be in a company that has those things figured out, it's mostly just on you just to, you know, be proactive and maybe a little bit more proactive than what you might have been used to before. Yeah. And like you were saying, you've got to, the infrastructure's there. They've been remote from day one. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you've got foundation in place, which which does help, I guess. It does help quite a lot. Whereas there's other companies trying to to work things out still as they go along, which is which is never ideal. Um, mm -hmm. what, what what about you as well, Ben? What's, what are you, because it sounds like, you, you, you've got you're working on some like exciting things uh, mm -hmm. with, with WordPress. What what are you excited for? I guess for the for the future. What does the future look like? Yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing. I think at WordPress.com, I think we have an incredible amount of opportunity in front of us. I think to really change people's perception of what WordPress.com is and what we can offer uh, to, to people. There's still, I mean, and I see this and I hear this, I think there's still um, 
I, I think that the the strengths of our offerings are not as um, they're not as well understood um, as as what they could be. I think both within like the WordPress community and I think more broadly with just people who use you know WordPress. Um, you know, it's still pretty common in the year and a, <laughs> in the year and a half that I've been working here, just whenever I like run into people like wherever, or I'm talking to friends or family or whoever's like asking like, Oh, so like, what do you do? And I say wordpress.com. It's very, very rare for anybody to understand the difference between wordpress.com versus wordpress.org. Um, and then when people do hear or for people who are like maybe somewhat familiar with wordpress.com, they have a very limited very outdated understanding of what wordpress.com is and what we can offer um, as a managed hosting provider. Um, and so that's kind of like the, the core challenge, I think, for us marketing wise right now. Um, but the sky's the limit. You know, I think um, what's most exciting um, to me about working at Automatic and working for wordpress.com specifically is there's not much of a ceiling that can be placed on what we can achieve. And um, when, when your potential is, I don't know if this sounds cliched, but when it's like, it's actually almost limitless, mm -hmm. you know, in practical terms, um, you know, I think what's exciting about that to me is like, we'll never be done, um, right. you know, and um and I think on top of that too, just the um, something else that's exciting to me is having the opportunity to work with an organization that has that that makes such a, a wide global impact. You know, like mm. on the world. You know, on you know on the internet in general. You know, on you know, um, and, and that, that just has like a very strong like mission and set of values that really resonate pretty deeply with me personally. It's, um, you know, there's a lot of things about the, uh, the, the open source ethic and advocating for the well being of the open web that I think, especially right now with a lot of things that are going on, that's, um, that's very motivating. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, it's not an opportunity I ever thought I'd have you know but 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 here i am so i'm just excited to yeah. get the chance to make the most of it and um see what what kind of dent <laughs> I, I can i can make in the world but yeah pretty significant yeah i think you, you'll make you are and will make a significant dent like you said i think as much as i'm on the i i start with wordpress.com but i'm on the wordpress.org side of things now but yeah, yeah, the sure. ethics and the values uh you know are there and I think that's why I've stuck with WordPress for such a, a, a long time. The open source element as well was a big thing for me. And the, just the, the flexibility, the the community around it as well was something that's is, is really kept me kept me involved with, with WordPress.com too. So it's good to hear that you know mm -hmm. it's not just it's also within the actual workings of how you work as well and yeah, it's it's. I'm like you. The ethics and the values of whoever I work for are always important to me as well. So, love that. I love that. But um, then it's been enlightening. It's been really interesting. I mean, I've got as ever. I've got so many more questions I'd love to ask. But I know you're busy. You have a busy day ahead as well. I just want to say thank you for for joining the podcast. We'll be keeping an eye out for, for where things take you next. And uh, uh, I just want to wish you all the best going forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This has been a great conversation. Um, definitely an, an honor to be invited to come on the show. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate um, this opportunity and, and, and all the support. And um, yeah, if anybody listening to this episode, if they have any questions or just want to reach out, um, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. So um, yeah, definitely feel feel free to get in touch. That's really good because I think uh, it's it's nice to know that you know, you you're opening that channel because I think 
there are lots of people may, that may have not just from the podcast, but it's good to know that there's that connection there. So what I'll do is I'll leave your your details in the show notes. But no, Ben um, uh, Saylor, Director of Inbound Marketing for WordPress.com. Uh, it's been great to speak to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you as well.